Today, I am really excited to uh, have two guests on today, Dr. Craig Brandman and Dr. James Underberg, make sure I said that right. And we're going to be talking today about something that's pretty hot, uh, a hot topic, and it is the uh, knowing your risk for for heart disease beyond the traditional uh, cholesterol test. So those those things that we all kind of understand and know to be a risk factor, and those particular uh, risk and traits. So we're talking today specifically about the NMR lipoprofile test that is available to uh, to us that we may not have known about. And uh, at the end and throughout this conversation, I'll be talking about where you can go to uh, get the test and have access to the test. But before then, I'd like for uh, each of you to introduce yourselves and uh, maybe why this topic is so relevant to us. Uh, today. So, uh, Dr. Brandman, can you start and introduce yourself? Sure, Cheryl. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, my name is Craig Brandman. I am the CEO and Chief Medical Officer of Step One Health. Um, and in my practice life, in my previous practice life, I was an interventional cardiologist and had the opportunity to take care of lots of people that um, had risk factors and had developed blockages in their arteries that both provided blood to their brain and their limbs as well as their their heart and unfortunately I did not during my practice life have access to this um, important technology and so the fact that it's now available and we are able to um, share it with with folks that seek us as a solution um, for their health care problems is very exciting uh, for me. Wonderful. And Dr. Underberg, please. So oh, my, my name is Dr. James Underberg. I am a clinical lipidologist, um, often known as a cholesterol specialist. If people say, what's a lipidologist? Um, I was a biochemist before I was a physician. I am an internist by training, not a cardiologist. Um, and my, my particular interest is patients with um, um, difficult to manage or severe cholesterol disorders. but. But my other primary practice focus is prevention, prevention of cardiovascular disease. And as an internist and lipidologist, uh, that drives my focus towards trying to uncover cholesterol abnormalities sooner in life before they actually cause heart disease and hopefully prevent my patients from ever having to see a cardiologist. And, and that's really how I come to my interest in technology such as um, the, the NMR lipo profile. So that is great and welcome to both of you. Uh, that, that's a great lead into our first question. So here at uh, Live FAQ, uh, we try to get the most frequently asked questions that people may have about this particular test and hopefully uh, some things they can do to, uh, to prevent, like you said, to talk about prevention and help themselves. So the first question is, what is the NMR lipoprofile test? So, so the NMR lipoprofile test um, it is a way of looking at someone's traditional cholesterol profile, the, the one that they're used to getting when they go for um, a traditional um, blood testing. And also, it looks at something called the LDL particle number. Um, uh, this is um, what we call a lipoprotein. It's a carrier of cholesterol. We'll get into this in a little bit. But the test does both. It gives you the, the number of the LDL particles, and it also gives you the traditional LDL cholesterol. It's information that allows you to act on a more personalized level with regards to getting and understanding someone's risk for cardiovascular disease. Perfect. So maybe I should back up a little bit because I, you know, making the assumption that everybody knows what cholesterol is. Can you just give us a, a brief answer? To what is cholesterol? So, so cholesterol is a waxy or oily substance that is both absorbed um, through the gut, um, transported throughout the body, and then excreted primarily by the liver back into the gut, and then in some cases reabsorbed. It's important for a variety of different reasons. It serves as a precursor to many of the hormones that are manufactured by cells in our body, testosterone, estrogen. Um, it's also um, important to cell structure. 
We need it for the membranes or the borders of our cells. Um, so it, it is a uniquely important um, um, uh, oily substance that, that we require for normal body function and development. Um, at the same time, however, because it, it's an oil or a fat, um, it doesn't mix well with water. And I always tell my patients, think of the bloodstream like water. And since oil and water don't mix, unlike what most people believe, cholesterol doesn't float in the bloodstream like logs on a river. Um, for cholesterol to be transported from one part of the body to the other, it must be carried inside a water-loving vehicle. And these water-loving vehicles are what we call lipoproteins. And the lipoproteins are the particles that carry cholesterol. So I always explain to my patients to think of cholesterol as, as a passenger. Think of the LDL particle, the lipoprotein, as the vehicle that carries the cholesterol. And if you want to know how bad traffic congestion is, you want to know how many cars are on the road, not how many people are in the cars. And that's really the difference between understanding cholesterol and its carrier lipoproteins. Well, so um, I, I did take the test, and, and I got an opportunity to talk to uh, Craig about it yesterday. So uh, it's, it really is an eye-opening experience. So the LDLP, then, is what you just described as the, the transport? Yes, exactly. It's the particle that carries cholesterol. It also carries triglycerides, which is fat, um, on top of cholesterol. But again, in many cases, uh, cholesterol, especially what we consider the bad cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol, um, differs from the number of particles. And when it does, it turns out that it probably is the particle number that is the more important piece of information to determine someone's cholesterol-related risk for heart disease. And that's where it's important to understand why there's a difference between the two, and also then understand why you need to measure this additional test. So one, of the, one of the things that we have focused on at Step 1 Health has been basically taking the message out to people that it's important to know your numbers. Mm -hmm. That, you know, you are really the person that is most, you know, involved in your health care. And knowing your numbers is an important first step in being able to identify you know, where you need to focus your attention and basically where your opportunities are to mitigate your risks. And as we were chatting about before um, we started this, uh, um, you know, this is a very, very important number because the incidence of heart disease and other cardiovascular related issues um, are, you know, very prominent in, you know, in our country. Yes, indeed. So that takes us to the next question. So how often do uh, does the LDLP and cholesterol kind of, uh, disagree? So, so the reality is that it, it depends on the types of patients being looked at. There, there are certain types of patients that we know are higher risk for heart disease, um, people with obesity, diabetes, what we call insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome. Um, and depending on the population that you're looking at, we're talking anywhere from, say, 40 to 70 percent of these patients will have a disagreement, or what we use, we use the term discordance, or disagreement between the LDLP, LDL particle number, and LDLC, the LDL cholesterol. And in these patients, when they disagree, the data firmly supports the concept that the LDLP is the more valuable or important predictor of cardiovascular risk in a positive way or in a negative way. Um, trust me, I love nothing more than telling a patient they're okay and that things are better than they thought they were. But in most cases, that's not what this information tells us. It usually discovers risk that we didn't know about which is obviously important because if you don't know about a problem, you can't go and fix it. So I guess the question for somebody who has always had normal cholesterol numbers, you know, would, there, would it be assumed that the LDLP numbers would be in normal range? The, the answer is, in many cases, you just don't know. Uh, you, you can guess. There are some patients where it's more likely that we will see this disagreement someone who is overweight, obese, diabetic, 
someone with liver disease, kidney disease, or women with polycystic ovarian syndrome, someone with low HDL cholesterol or high triglycerides. But I will tell you that oftentimes I will see a patient who is referred to me because of unexplained early cardiovascular disease and everything is normal. And when we go look at the LDL particle number, it is elevated beyond where we thought it would be. And so there are plenty of cases of people who don't fall into these typical categories who still have this disagreement. So I don't want to get too technical, even though I think this is a really, uh, you know, knowing this science is, is amazing, but how is the LDLP measured? So I won't let you get too complicated because <laughs> I don't have that degree of expertise, even though I was a biochemist way back when. Um, we've all heard of MRI machines and the concept of what we call nuclear magnetic resonance. This is the ability of um, um, molecules and atoms to vibrate and produce uh, frequencies. And it turns out that, that different types of cholesterol particles exhibit different types of frequencies. And so the way this testing is done is the blood stays in the tube. It never leaves the tube. It's placed in a small version of an MRI machine, an NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance um, device, that actually measures the frequency of these different particles. And then based on known standards that are available and using a variety of computer-generated algorithms, uh, they can actually measure both the size of these particles and their concentration or how many of them there are. Um, and this is information that, as I said before, is particularly useful in assessing risk for cardiovascular disease. Perfect. Now, I think in one of our uh, previous uh, sessions, uh, Dr. Bramman, you talked about the lipid panel. So how does the NMR differ from uh, the lipid panel? I think that the information that we get from the NMR um, test basically goes into a level of detail which is frequently much more important and much more revealing than the standard lipid panel. It was sort of like when we discussed your results yesterday. You know, the good news was I had the opportunity, as Dr. Um, Underberg has indicated, to you know tell you that everything was great and that there was nothing really that we needed to to be overly concerned about. And I would agree with him that that is always a very happy conversation. But I think that you know we were able to identify you know areas that were much more informative than we were able to previously understand from you know the standard lipid panel so i think that what you're getting is increased detail about things which previously had been unknown to us right so i get, you know and, and you know i don't mind sharing my information and since it's me sharing my information <laughs> my numbers were just above normal i mean you know maybe uh, two or three Points above, above normal, so but it was really great to see the difference because I've never had a high cholesterol number. So even have being at the top of the range was a surprising discovery for me personally. So I guess the question then is why should uh, why should a patient check their LDLP number? Well, I, I think there are, are a bunch of different reasons. I, certainly, um, anyone with heart disease anyone taking cholesterol-lowering medicine, I think wants to know that they've achieved not only the appropriate LDL cholesterol goal, but also LDL particle goal. If you're going to take medications, get the full benefit of them, and maybe you even need less medicine than you're on, or you're done with your therapy, um, so that's important. But also patients who don't have disease, but maybe are at increased risk for disease, um, don't truly understand the degree of that risk and how much of a change needs to be made without doing the LDL particle number. So anyone with a family history of premature heart disease, anyone with other risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, I would even say gout, women I said with polycystic ovarian disease, liver disease, kidney disease, all of these are the types of conditions that might increase the likelihood of having a difference between the two often we get seen or get sent patients who have what we call isolated low HDL cholesterol where the good HDL cholesterol is low but everything else is normal and uh, there is a percentage of these patients who will have elevated LDL particle numbers even when everything else is normal 
So again, a lot of different patients. I think that you know one of the things that I think is very important is that you know the ease and the cost of getting this information, which can be very important in terms of understanding what steps need to be taken next, you know, in terms of, of reducing the risk of having very significant disease, makes it almost. I would say a test that the majority of people um, ought to avail themselves to because not only is the cost of being hospitalized for one of these things very significant, but the effect on one's life, not only in the quality of life, but in the length of life is also, you know, profound. And so, you know, getting these numbers, identifying where there may be opportunities to, to reduce risk. I think is something that we have talked to a number of people out in the you know in the insurance community as being an important message to take to their beneficiaries for all of the reasons that I've just mentioned. Right. So and and just to take a quick break, I'm going to uh, add the link to where you can order the test in the description of uh, this recorded session, and I'll also do it underneath the the live recording as well here in a second. But uh, can we talk to I know some tests you have to uh, fast ahead of time and some not necessarily. So how do you prepare for the particle test or the LDLP? Well, the, the ideal way is to fast, an overnight fast. Um, and that's because as part of the test, we do a traditional lipid panel too. And um, triglycerides in particular are more acutely affected by the fasting or non-fasting state. Um, and so to get a better complete picture, I think an overnight fast is really ideal for something like this. I will tell you that if a patient is not fasting and they come in, we can still do the test and get some reasonable information from it. But I think to, to, to best obtain ideal results, I think fasting is, is desirable. Wonderful. So um, let's talk about now uh, the prevention and and, and how we can help what, if we do uh, in, have an indication of, of uh, higher LDLP numbers. How can I lower my LDLP number? Well, I, I think key first is, is knowing that your LDL particle number is elevated is the first step because then there's motivation to make change. Um, without knowing about a problem, most people will just continue on the way they are. So just the knowledge itself is key. That's number one, that there's a problem. Number two, though, uh, one of the nice things about this test is that it does give you some additional, um, as a physician, useful information to try to understand the cause of the abnormality. Um, the total number is the one we're most concerned about with regards to risk, but oftentimes the test gives the practitioner some additional information that can help them better understand is this a lifestyle issue, is it more of a genetic or an inherited issue, um, and what type of, of interventions either lifestyle or pharmacologic would be best suited for that particular patient's problem. The more you understand about a problem, the more likely you're able to intervene appropriately. Information is a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, and I tell my patients that all the time. And so if someone had the typical metabolic syndrome pattern, they were, um, had, had abdominal obesity and um, smaller particles and too many of them, then that's someone who would respond better to a certain type of dietary intervention. And that's useful information and we know that, 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 that it, it helps. At the same time, certain medications might be more appropriate to use. And choosing right the first time around saves time, money, and a lot of other issues that we don't need to worry about. So why not be precise in all of our interventions? And I think that's what this allows us to do. Okay. I think that you know, the, the, the focus being on prevention is something that I think we both you know, com are in complete agreement about because when you are in the early identification of risks and identifying where the opportunities are, then you can have the most positive outcome. You have the, the opportunity for the most positive outcome. And, and that is why uh, at Step 1 Health, we have basically been so focused on taking the message out into the community, um, using the, you know, the tools like live FAQ and, and, and other ways of reaching large groups of people, that knowing your numbers, your specific numbers, 
um, and identifying where your opportunities are is the most important thing that you can do in terms of interacting with your health and your wellness. Absolutely. Uh, so the next question is, uh, you know, when should I get tested? Are there any uh, particular you know, events that should, uh, should spur getting the test? Well, as we mentioned earlier, I think if you're aware of any changes, both either to yourself or to your family with regards to the risk for cardiovascular disease, I think that should trigger testing if it hasn't been done. So say a, a, a parent or a sibling has an unexplained or premature cardiovascular event, a heart attack or a stroke. Well, we know that increases your risk, and so a little more knowledge about your cholesterol-related risk with the NMR lipo profile I think would be reasonable. Um, say you develop hypertension or find out you have diabetes. Uh, say someone decides to start treating you with cholesterol-lowering medicine. I think all of these are trigger points that say, gee, I, I think we should know more about this. Sudden weight gain, um, mm -hmm. the diagnosis of kidney disease or liver disease, all of these are the types of triggers that I think would say to someone, it's time to get tested. And then um, how often would you suggest or how often is it advised to then recheck? Right. So uh, I think a lot depends on what the intervention is. So if, if the intervention based on an abnormality is, is a lifestyle intervention, uh, we know that, that people don't make changes overnight. And so bringing them back three weeks later is probably a waste of everyone's time. Um, so being realistic about the time needed to make a change, I'd say minimum three months I think is reasonable, um, would, 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 would make sense. On the other hand, the intervention is um, a pharmacologic intervention say someone started on a statin, uh, we usually bring those patients back within a month to see what's happened to their cholesterol, and that would be the same case for their LDL particle number. Um, so I would tell you at any point where you would recheck their standard cholesterol profile, that would be then time to recheck the NMR lipo profile. You know, one of, the, one of the stories that I like to share with people is that I've had the opportunity to work with a young woman who does not, for all intents and purposes, have any indication of any risk factors. Um, she wanted to be thorough in terms of just understanding that there might be something there that, you know, she would not have had a, otherwise a reason to be concerned about. She's, you know, 26 years old. Um, you know, her weight is perfect. She exercises. Um, she does live in Texas, so she has a tendency to eat a little bit more. Um, on the unhealthy side than, than, than many other people do. And we did, um, we, did a, uh, we did an NMR lipo protein panel on her, and her LDLP numbers were almost 3,000. I mean, they wow. were just, they were, they were very disturbing. And um, she did not really want to go immediately to taking medication. She wanted to see whether or not there were some lifestyle changes that she could make, and unfortunately, there weren't a lot of opportunities um, because she was already doing pretty much what you would have advised her to do otherwise. Um, and over the six months now that I've been working with her, she's brought those numbers down into the mid to low 1,000 range just with alterations in her diet, increasing her exercise, and basically being more aware of, of, of this issue. And so I think that, you know, as we've talked about, bringing people back after they have instituted the kinds of things that are the opportunities and rechecking them is a very important part. You know, for her, it has really reinforced the, um, the benefit of the things that she has chosen to um, adjust in her life. And I think on a, on a longitudinal basis is going to make it much more likely that she will continue to be compliant and mitigate this risk. Um, and she may or may not end up on a statin, but at least so far we're going in the right direction. Yeah, I have to tell you that, that I, I think something that, that goes through every physician's or every practitioner's mind when they order a test is what am I going to do based on the results? If I'm not going to change anything, then there's probably no reason to order the test. And I think what, what makes this such an actionable intervention is that there are lots of things that you might change based on this test, um, either lifestyle or pharmacologic, 
and as I mentioned earlier, in some cases, even reduction of pharmacologic therapy. So that understanding the importance of the intervention based on the test, I think, really helps you understand uh, when it needs to be ordered and why it needs to be done. And those are two key points. So I, I love the example, and, and I think three months maybe retesting is, is, is a great indicator uh, to see, especially Especially for, for some of us who uh, need a little bit more motivation or encouragement that our lifestyle changes are actually um, taking effect. So I, I get that. So for, for most people then, you know, how long will it take to see some type of imp improvement in their uh, LDLP numbers? Well, I, again, I, I would tell you that if, if it's a, an intervention with medication, say a statin, I think mm -hmm. a month is reasonable. If we're talking changes in diet and lifestyle, then I think several months. I usually give my patients three months. So that's a nice time frame to think about. There are some people who will see dramatic improvement in one or two weeks, but the body has some compensatory changes that often take place. And you, you want to wait for enough time to get a, a true um, state of equilibrium in that person's um, lipid metabolism before you consider any additional changes, which is why I like a month. Well, and I think that, you know, that makes a lot of sense because I think what you don't want to do when you're making dietary and lifestyle changes is bring people back too soon and have the changes they've made not really have any impact on these numbers and their risk because then they're going to basically sort of feel like, well, you know, I'm making all of these, these sacrifices and I'm not really getting anywhere with it, so, you know, why should I continue, you know, why should I continue to... to really realize the benefits of the changes that they've made um, is, is, the, is the right time to bring them back. And I would agree that the three months for dietary and lifestyle changes with all the compensating things that the body has to go through um, is the right time frame. I think the words you used for me uh, was patience. So, <laughs> was, you know, take the steps and then be patient enough to uh, to allow them to work. So I think that's, uh, that's I'm, I'm going to really try for patience. <laughs> I just want it to happen right now. <laughs> well, you know, I think that, you know, one of the things, and I'm sure that Dr. Underberg tells his patients this too, um, you know, one of the things I think it's important to tell people is, is that, you know, we all want to, you know, we all have goals and things that we try and do and we want to be better but we're human and we're not perfect and you know sometimes it's hard to basically make these changes and do it on a consistent basis um, and you know having things that reinforce that kind of struggle um, and being patient and knowing that you know it's going to take some time but you know the first step is the first step you know is an important way to basically help people really be compliant I mean what all practitioners know is, as Dr. Underberg indicated earlier, you know, it's pretty easy for us to identify problems and most competent practitioners know what people need to do to address the problems. The real challenge for us is to get people to be compliant and really do the things that we, you know, we share with them that they need to do. I mean, even remembering to take a pill every day. You know, you'd think that that would be pretty simple. Well, I mean, taking a pill every day is much simpler than getting out and walking when you live in a place where it's 110 degrees during the day. I mean, you know, you know, so, you know, being compliant with the things that you need to do is a very important part of how successful clinicians work with their patients. Well, I... I, I have to tell you, we're at the end of our first round of questions because I have a feeling that uh, this conversation is going to spark uh, several more uh, questions and follow-ups. And so I thank you both for for joining us. And for people who'd like to order the test, I'm going to add a link to the discussion and the description to uh, to this video, and you'll be able to just link directly to it. And uh, it'll also be on LiveFAQ.com and on the Step One Health YouTube channel. So thank you again, Craig and Dr. Underberg. This, is, this has been really informative and, and kind of fun. <laughs> thank you very much.